Welcome to the Employment Law and HR Podcast with your host, Allison Colley. Hello and welcome to this episode 171 of the Employment Law and HR Podcast. I'm your host, Alison Colley. I'm an employment solicitor and HR specialist, and I run the firm Real Employment Law Advice, where we provide employment law advice and HR advice to both employers and employees throughout the UK. So if you have any questions or issues that are arising in your organisation, or if you know of anyone who needs employment support, then do not hesitate to get in touch with us. We provide advice on a day-to-day basis, and we offer an initial free telephone call. You can contact me. The best way of contacting me is via my email, which is alison at realemploymentoradvice.co.uk. This week's episode of the podcast is part two of my mini series on capability and performance issues. And this week I'm going to be covering how to get started with the process in terms of the formal capability procedure. If you didn't listen to the last episode 170, which was out two weeks ago, I covered off how to get started with capability issues. So really dealing with the starting points and the informal conversations. This time we're taking it to the next step once you've already undertaken that. So if you haven't listened to episode 170, then I recommend that you go back and listen to that before you move on to this stage. So without further ado, I'm going to get into this week's featured content. Yes, so as I mentioned, I'm now moving on in part two of this mini series to talk about the formal procedure. And for those of you who have listened to episode 170, you'll know I talked about going through a process before you even get started, just to make sure that you're following the correct process, whether that be informal or formal. But there are a few things, again, once you've decided to embark on the formal process that you need to do before you start. The first thing, of course, is to check what your internal capability procedure says in terms of the steps that you need to take, what's required by way of a process. It's really important to check what it says in case there's something additional that goes over and above what I'm sort of recommending in this podcast. So check what that says and follow that accordingly. If you're concerned that either it's too comprehensive and too lengthy or it doesn't include enough steps, then you can also refer to the ACAS guidance on this, or you could get some specific advice um, from someone like myself about the process. Then again, it's asking if you're the correct person to deal with the issue. We talked about this last week, but ideally it should be managed. The process should be managed by the employee's line manager who knows them best, who works with them and has the ability to really analyse and uh, supervise their work. If you are the line manager, and this is the first time you're going down a formal capability process with someone, then it's important again for you to seek advice and support in relation to the process. And if you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed by it, then to seek advice from either your HR or from your own manager. And then think about what you're trying to achieve. I talked about this in the last episode, but it's really important to once again emphasise what you are trying to achieve here and keep this in mind throughout. So you've got to the stage where You've decided, you've been through all the informal steps, you've decided you're going down the formal capability route, you've been through all the points I just mentioned about getting started. And then the first step in relation to the formal process is the investigation. Now, this may be a fairly short investigation because you may already have all of the information collated. And certainly if you've been having those initial pre-conversations with the employee and dealing with things informally, then you probably already have some of this information to hand. But in essence, what you're trying to do is to collate what your concerns are about their performance or capability for the role. So if there is any evidence or any notes of previous conversations about their performance or capability, then these would be part of your investigation and part of the evidence that you would use. It's also important to review the job description for the employee, look at any records of one-to-ones they might have had, as I said earlier, notes from previous conversations or discussions and look at their appraisal records or their training records as well. And if necessary, 
and you need to, you could speak confidentially to other colleagues who work with them. For example, there may be other managers or supervisors who they've worked with who um, have come up with this information about their performance that you need to take their statement from or their account of events. So basically you're collating all of the information in support of your concerns about their capability or performance. Now when you say step one investigation it might seem again as though that this is something that's going to take you a long time or could be particularly complicated. It doesn't have to be complex or complicated and as I say if you've already followed the things I said in the informal process through discussion with the employee then you would probably have a lot of this information already. Step two of the capability process is to invite the employee to a meeting. Now hopefully If you followed my advice, this won't be the first time that the employee is aware of your concerns. And so it won't come as a surprise to them that you're now going through the formal capability process. But you should still put it in writing to them what the nature is of the alleged poor performance or capability issues that you've identified. You should include a copy of the evidence and the information that you're going to refer to at the hearing. You should tell them your concerns and what your background to those concerns are. So give them enough information so that they can sufficiently prepare for the hearing. So they know exactly what you're going to be talking about, exactly what your concerns are and where you're coming from. You should notify them that they can be accompanied by law, and this is to the meeting by either a trade union rep or a colleague. And you should also state in the letter what the possible consequences are as a result of the meeting. So is that that it could be a warning? Could it be that there's a warning and a formal performance improvement plan or if you're at the stage later on it could be possibly dismissal or if it's serious negligent misconduct or negligent capability issues then it could be dismissal. And the notice of the meeting should give them sufficient time to prepare. So it's not really fair and reasonable to give someone a letter um, one day and it's like on a Monday and expect them to attend a meeting on a Tuesday. That's not fair and reasonable, but a couple of days should be sufficient for them to be able to prepare. Now, once you have sent them the invitation, the next step is actually meeting with the employee. And I acknowledge that for many people, this can be quite stressful and you're not really sure what to do in that meeting, what you can say and what you can't say. And often managers are really concerned about getting it wrong. So again, this comes back to preparation If you've already been having those regular conversations with the employee, you've collated all of your information, it will make the meeting a lot easier. Yes, it is a formal meeting. And yes, the outcome of that meeting could be serious consequences for the employee. But you are doing a fair and reasonable process here. And if you followed all the steps before, as I say, then you are being fair to the employee. So again, the meeting should be dealt with by the employee's manager but the manager can be accompanied by someone to help with the process and or to take notes. So that may be someone in in HR or another manager who can support them during the process. You need to decide at the meeting if you're going to take a written record of what's said or with everyone's consent if you're going to audio record it. Now, my preference with these things is to have an audio recording of the events because that way you have an absolute clear record of what is said but not only a clear record of what is said, but how it's said, because sometimes things may be written down don't come out the same way as they do if you actually hear them being said. So um, again, if you feel confident enough to do that, um, having an audio recording can actually help save disputes later on. But if that can't be agreed or there isn't any way of doing that or you feel uncomfortable, then a good written record of what's discussed should be taken. At the outset of the meeting, You need to identify all the persons present and the role that they play in the meeting. So, for example, you're the line manager. I'm your line manager, but I'm also the chair of the meeting today and I'm going to be making the decision in relation to the outcome of the capability hearing. And I've got Joe Bloggs with me from HR who's going to be taking notes and advising on the process. You've attended yourself and you've decided not to bring anyone with you. Just to be clear, you understand that you have the right to be accompanied and you've chosen not to be accompanied that kind of thing or if they have been accompanied you've brought along your friend Bob who's going to be here to support you through the meeting and whilst Bob can support you they're not going to answer questions on your behalf 
So that kind of thing, that's how you start the meeting, you set up. And then the next bit is just to say to them, have you received all of the evidence? Have you had an opportunity to review it? And if they say yes, then you tell them that this is their opportunity to respond and ask them to respond. And then just take it from there in terms of a conversation, listen to what they have to say, and then answer any questions they may have and anything that may arise as a result. And again, this is where the pre-work that you've done with the employee and in preparation for the meeting really help you out because it will be a much easier process. What can happen and you might be surprised by is an employee may say that they've had some issue going on in their life or that they have a medical condition that they may not have disclosed before. Sometimes an employee may be reluctant to tell you what's really going on with them in an informal process and it may only be at the point in time that they realise the seriousness of what's happening that they then decide to open up and really tell you what's going on. So don't be surprised if something comes out of that meeting that you weren't expecting in relation to the employee. And of course if they disclose something that you weren't aware of and you need to take some advice about that don't be afraid to say, well, I'm going to stop the meeting now and I need to look into this further and come back to you. Or if they disclose, for example, something's going on in their life, then you can say, look, shall we pause the meeting and we'll talk about that and then we'll come back to this at a later date or later on in the day. Or you can always just say, right, I'm going to pause the meeting and come back to you with the outcome. So you don't have to deliver the outcome um, immediately at the end of the meeting. So if you're not sure whether you want to issue a warning because they've told you something else that you weren't aware of, then you can always have a think about that, get some advice and then come back to them. The times in which employees become aggressive about these things and defensive are when they are unaware of what's going on or they feel in some way that they're being treated in an unjust manner. So sometimes an employee's expectation of what's required is not aligned to your own expectation of what is required and as a result they feel aggrieved and they feel like they're doing nothing wrong. In those circumstances the best way of dealing with it is to explain clearly what's expected and why you think they're not meeting that requirement and then if necessary obviously follow up in writing. Now if this is the first step in the capability process it's unlikely that you're going to move to a final written warning or dismissal if this is the first time you're having this formal discussion. Even if you've had informal discussions in the past, it's not normally appropriate to go straight to dismissal. So you're more than likely going to be issuing them with a first written warning as a result of the outcome of the capability meeting. And within that first written warning, you need to be very clear about exactly what the standards of performance that are required and what they haven't met. So all the things you've discussed with them. And then you need to set out targets for improvement. So really as clear as possible about what you need them to achieve and the timescale that they need to do it by. If you've identified any training or support or supervision that may be required for them, exactly what you're going to provide, put that in the letter to make sure that they're aware and then set aside a period for review. And obviously, you need to say in there what the consequences could be for failing to improve within that review period. Now, one of the issues that often comes up or causes dispute is what is a sufficient time for a period of review. Now, if you leave it too long, then the whole process can become drawn out and actually you're not going to get the best out of the employee Um, or it can become forgotten about in the day-to-day tasks that, you know, overcome us all. So you need a a period of review, which isn't too long, but also isn't too short, or so short that the employee won't have an opportunity to really get into improvement. So you need to consider exactly what you're asking of them, and how realistic it is for them to be able to improve in the timescale that you're setting. So again, In order to be able to rely on that to go through the next stage of the capability process, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've acted reasonably in setting those goals and requirements for the employee and the timescale for doing so. If despite your best efforts, 
of going through the improvement process, giving a period of review, providing support, all of that, the employee still doesn't improve within the time scale, or in fact, their performance decreases or declines further, then you need to start the process again in terms of collating the information. Again, this shouldn't take much more time this time because you've already got it there. Inviting the employee to a meeting and going through the steps in the meeting again about giving them the opportunity to respond, seeing if there are any ways in which they can improve, all of that sort of thing. And again, if there is no mitigating factors or nothing that's happened that would change the process or your mind about the capability and performance process, then you would then issue them with a final written warning. It is possible if you wanted to, to issue a second written warning, if you feel that they need a little bit more time or that they are taking steps to improve, but maybe it's not enough, then you can add another layer of warning. But if you wanted to go from the first written warning to the final written warning, then as long as you've behaved reasonably in the process, then this would be okay. And of course, you then follow up that meeting in the final written warning, again, setting out all the things we did before and a timetable for review. And then if, again, the employee doesn't improve within the timescale that's required, doesn't meet the targets and expectation that you have, then you repeat the process of collating your evidence, providing the evidence to the employee, inviting them to a meeting, holding the meeting, and then informing them of the outcome. And you can fairly dismiss an employee for capability reasons or performance reasons if you have followed the previous process. So if you have a first written warning, a final written warning, and then they still haven't met the the required level, then you can move to dismiss them. Now, in my experience, it's not very often that an employer follows a fair and reasonable process and gets to the point of dismissal in a capability process. Often, a variety of things come up before it gets to that point. So it is very rare um, and often employers will not like to go through a capability process in the full way because of the time that it takes. But I will be covering that off in the next episode of the podcast where I'll be talking about capability as a potentially fair reason for dismissal and the potential legal issues that can arise from a capability or performance management process and dismissal as a result. But really the headline here is if you followed a fair process, you can get to the point of dismissal with them after a period of time. So there we have it. That's the capability process from the start to the finish ending in dismissal. In the next episode of the podcast, I'll be talking about the legal issues and other things that can arise, as I said. So there we are. Just to summarise what the process is in the simplest form is you as the manager do your preparation. You undertake an investigation by collating evidence of exactly what are the issues in relation to performance. You provide that to the employee and invite them to a meeting at which they can be accompanied. At the meeting, you listen to what they have to say, and if necessary, issue them with a first written warning. In the written warning, you should set out a period of time for improvement, and you should set out exactly what's required of them in that time. And if they don't meet that, then you follow the whole process again, and then issue a final written warning. And if they still don't improve to the necessary standard, you follow the process again, and invite them to a meeting, which then may result in the termination of their employment. I forgot to mention at the end, just now, that of course, after termination of employment, you should of course offer the employee the opportunity to appeal against their dismissal and go through the process of an appeal if necessary. Hopefully you found this episode helpful and it has enabled you to see that actually If you follow all of the steps in an appropriate way, a capability process doesn't have to be that scary or complicated, but it can be fairly time consuming. Of course, if you have any questions about anything that we've discussed in this episode of the podcast, please do not hesitate to get in touch with myself or any member of the team. You can find all of our details on our website, which is realemploymentoradvice.co.uk. 
If you're a regular listener to the podcast, then you will know that every fortnight I put out hopefully really good content for you and useful information. So I just have one favour to ask you and that is to go over to our YouTube channel. So if you go onto YouTube and search Real Employment Law Advice, then you'll see the page or our channel and I'd be grateful if you could subscribe. We've got a series of videos coming out shortly that we spent some considerable time putting together and it'll be great if the more people that can see them, the better. So the more people who subscribe, the more people are likely to see our content. So I'd be really grateful if you could do that for me. Thanks very much for listening and I'll be back in two weeks time with another episode on capability. Thanks again for listening. Just want to finalise by saying I wouldn't be a lawyer unless I had a legal disclaimer. So I must just say to you, that the information in this podcast is for information only. It's general review and a general update. It's always necessary to get specific legal advice about your circumstances. So please don't rely on anything that you've heard in this podcast. But please do feel free to contact me if you'd like further information or specific advice.